Cuántas ciudades caben en una ciudad, cuántas fronteras te atraviesan tienes tú que atravesar Invisibles como el aire, el cemento o hechas del lenguaje Cuántas ciudades caben en una ciudad, cuántas fronteras te atraviesan tienes tú que atravesar Invisibles como el aire, el cemento o hechas del lenguaje Aquí estamos, aguantando Existimos porque respiramos mm, de carne y hueso que quieran borrar los más abajo. The Americana provides the Whitney with an unprecedented opportunity to present a new understanding of art history, one that acknowledges the wide ranging and profound influence that the Mexican muralists had on style, subject matter, and ideology of art in the United States between 1925 and 1945. The exhibition reaffirms our connection to Mexico and its rich, rich cultural traditions and reminds us that the power of art and cultural and artistic influence is not bound by borders. Through their example, the Mexican muralists inspired American artists to create epic narratives about American history and everyday life, and they motivated artists to use their art to protest economic, social, and racial injustices. As you will see, our team at the Whitney has found amazing ways to bring these murals to life, which was not so easy to do, considering it would be very hard to bring all those murals here. I'm excited for you to find new understanding and context for many of the new and, um, and familiar and unfamiliar murals. Vida Americana features 200 works by some 60 Mexican and US artists. The show is also traveling to the McNay Art Museum in San Antonio, Texas, where it will be on display this summer and into the early fall. And I just want to acknowledge, and you will hear all the thank yous because they're so deserved, um, requires such incredible support over many years. And I want to thank the foundations, the corporations, and the many individual donors who have made this possible. In particular, I want to start with our lead foundation, our lead supporter, the Jerome L. Green Foundation, who has been a long time and steadfast supporter and really understands the importance of Prevent, presenting shows of, um, of art that helps us rethink who we are and where we are at any given time. So thank you um, to the Green Foundation. I'm also incredibly thankful to the city and city, city Banamex, Delta, and Aero Mexico for their sponsorship. And, um, and bear with me, I have lots of names, but these people deserve the thank yous because otherwise this wouldn't be happening. The Judy Art, Hart Angelo Exhibition Fund, the Barbara Haskell American Fellows Legacy Fund, the Henry Luce Foundation, who is there over and over again for us, the Terra Foundation for American Art, and the Whitney's National Committee. I'd also like to acknowledge the generosity of Mr. and Mrs. Horowitz Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and we also received significant support from the Arthur F. and Alice E. Adams Charitable Foundation. Our thanks are also um, to the Garcia Family Foundation, to the Robert Lehman Foundation, it really takes a village. Actually, in this case, I think it took two countries. Um, and also, I want to acknowledge the curatorial research and travel came from the Stephen Alexandra Cohen Foundation. And um, one that I always like to thank is the Wyeth Foundation for American Art um, that has gotten behind this beautiful catalog, which hopefully you've all seen or will see, um, which was quite the undertaking and is a wonderful um, volume presenting lots of new information and materials. But finally, um, um, in terms of thanks, I really would like to thank the individual donors there. We had more than 20 individual donors. I've been told that some of them were actually moved to tears, not just about the show itself, but they were moved to tears that the paintings and works in their collection had to leave their homes to come here. That's how precious people feel about these works. It's very, very hard. They're very fragile. A lot of these things had never left Mexico before or very infrequently. And I want to thank you. Some of them are here today. Um, but I just want to thank you because without you, the show would not exist and would not have the richness that it does. I also want to acknowledge there's over 40 different museums from the US um, um, and also from Europe, from Mexico, from Argentina, from Japan that loaned works to this, to this exhibition. And a special thanks to the Secretariat of Culture and the National Institute of Fine Arts and Letters, otherwise known as INBAL, 
for their support of this exhibition, their assistance with loans of works from both Mexican collectors and um, other pu public and private collections. This exhibition has been a major undertaking, and I want to thank our team of curators, led by the one and only Barbara Haskell. Um, the team has tirelessly, tirelessly um, worked to bring the show to life, and in addition to Barbara, Marcella Guerrero, our assistant curator, both of whom you'll meet shortly this morning, Sarah Humphreville, our senior curatorial assistant, Alana Hernandez, who is our former curatorial project assistant, and Sofia Silva, our curatorial fellow. Um, as Rivera once said, you have to trust a true compliment as much as a critique. This is a true compliment, so remember that. There are also so many others on the Team Vita, um, Whitney Staff, Zoe Triple, Christy Putnam, Anna Martin, Brenna Cothran, ben, uh, Beth Turk, Caitlin Birmingham. This is for the catalog, the registration, the exhibition design. Um, Catherine Potts and Ann Bird for education, Matt Skopek in, in conservation. It truly takes a village. This show was yours for the last five years. Now it is all of your shows. So I want to end um, by making just a few quick um, thanks to Colleen Smith. Scott Rothkoff, our chief curator, will talk at length. But um, Colleen Smith's installation, which is on the fifth floor, which, as I mentioned, is a really nice juxtaposition, is a really transformative, multidisciplinary work that really reflects on memory and shared histories. And, um, and you'll see um, the kind of broader connections to the importance of what's going on in the world today. Um, this exhibition is part of an ongoing exhibition series of, um, that we devote to mid-career and emerging artists, and I want to thank Nordstrom, um, uh, who are at the other end of the High Line, who support our contemporary art shows. It's not something that I would have necessarily connected with them, but they thought it was great to do contemporary art shows, and we're thrilled. Um, I just want to say, after introducing Scott Rothkopf, um, we're, going to do a, uh, we're going to change our format. We're going to do a little interview format this morning together with Barbara Haskell and Marcel Guerrero um, to talk about the exhibition. But I would first like to introduce Scott Rothkopf, our chief curator, um, and also our maestro who um, orchestrates everything um, art in this museum. So thank you. Thank you, Adam. Good morning, everyone. I promise I will not be talking at length. Uh, the, what you want to hear is following me. but. I couldn't resist uh, taking a moment uh, with all of you here to see these uh, two remarkable exhibitions and let you know a little bit about <coughs> what is coming up this year. Uh, as most of you uh, may know, many of you may know, the Whitney turns 90 this year. We were founded in 1930 and we opened our doors to the public in 1931. And we have so many incredible uh, special exhibitions and projects on the horizon this year to honor both our history uh, and the kind of spirit of innovation I think that uh, brings us towards the future. Uh, just this season alone, we have, of course, the shows that are opening today. And it changes that narrative to show that it was the Mexican artist that had the most profound, pervasive influence on the art of this country. I like to say that if it weren't for people like Orozco and eventually Siqueiros, we wouldn't have the Jackson Pollock that we all know and love. for a fun entry, doesn't it? <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I'm going to start off with saying, um, what took so long? Um, you know, you started thinking about this show 15 years ago. So what um, initially drew me to the whole idea of looking at the at Mexican art was when I began looking at the cultural renaissance that occurred in Mexico at the end of of, of that country's revolution, and began to notice similarities between artists like Rivera and Thomas Hart Benton, the way they handled history as an epic, socially moving document. And it was then four years ago, thanks to you, that the exhibition was scheduled, and we began jumping into the research in earnest. 
And um, do you think it's really a revolutionary idea to be thinking about the influences coming from south to north as opposed to um, uh, east to west. I do. I think, uh, as, as I said in the video, that for so long, those of us who you know, studied art history have been taught that it was the French that dominated American art in the 20th century. And this exhibition really rewrites that narrative. I think that one of the things that happened after World War II that we discovered is with the rise and the hegemony of abstraction, the um, fear of communism that overtook all of America, and the connection between nationalism and fascist Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union, the Mexicans were in a way, um, if not discredited, at least marginalized in some sense. And now we're in an era where artists are once again looking at political and social issues and wanting to engage in a public way in pressing uh, issues of life. And I think the Mexican muralists can once again provide a model that's really critical for us now. That's interesting. I mean, the Whitney did have a foray in its early days into looking at Mexican murals. Can you say a word about that? Right, it, it did. It showed uh, Orozco, uh, Julieta Force, the director at the time, purchased Orozco's work. Um, we showed artists that, um, some of the other Mexican artists. We never showed Rivera, we never sh showed Siqueiros, though. They were almost too radical for the Whitney, I think. Um, Orozco at the time seemed maybe more palatable, but then we we went on to other things, and it was a very short window in which we supported the Mexican muralists. Now the influence is not just stylistic, but it's also in terms of content. T can you talk a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah. So the style, all of you will see when you go upstairs, the style is pervasive. So artists responded in different ways to all three of the leading Mexican muralists and channeled their styles into their own expressions. But in terms of subject matter, absolutely there was an influence. Not only this sense of describing history in this epic way, the whole idea about the how to depict the fight against oppression and injustice is, is very telling. And I think basically, though, the subtext is the ideology that art is public, that art can be modern, that it can be visually powerful, and yet at the same time tell stories about everyday life and history that are relevant to people, everyday people, not just the elite and the wealthy, but tell them in a style that's accessible to the public. Marcella, can you talk, I mean, Sequeiros is one of your favorites. Yes. And um, can you talk about why and also the difference maybe in how Sequeiros may have approached it to Rivera and Orozco and then maybe say a word about the, um, the LA mural which we have reproduced and the importance of that? Yeah, um, so Siqueiros was the youngest of the three and the one to come in 1932. He came for the first time to LA. Um, actually, before I, I jump in straight to Siqueiros, let me say a word about these two images that we have here. Because one thing that was a little bit of a challenge for us, as you can imagine, is how to represent murals that are frescoes, that, that are in situ. Um, and so we, and we also wanted to give our audience a diversity of experiences when it came to how to reproduce these murals. So for each of the big three, um, we have reproductions from high resolution images. So we have one for the uh, Orozco, the, uh, like the one you can see here, which we've even recreated the arch. Um, the way it is at the dining hall at Pomona College. Um, and we have one for uh, Rivera and we have one for Siqueiros. Um, in the case of Rivera, there's a, a funny anecdote um, because when we were thinking of how to represent the Detroit Institute of Art mural, um, that one, I remember we struggled for some weeks and um, it wasn't until uh, our, our amazing exhibition coordinator, Zoe Tipple, that she was Googling in the middle of the night, um, you know, just Diego Rivera, Detroit Institute of Art murals, and she came across these panoramic photographs, uh, 360 degrees photographs, by this amazing man, Dave uh, Mariotti from uh, Detroit, shout out to him. Um, and he allowed us to use these images. And um, so when you go upstairs, you're going to see a beautiful uh, panoramic uh, animated spherical, it has a bunch of words, um, a video of the murals. You can also zoom in and the iPads. So this, a similar uh, thing happened with the case of Siqueiros and America Tropical. And as you said, you know, I'm a huge fan. This mural has an amazing story behind it because he was 
Um, when he arrived in LA in 1932, one of the assignments, one of the commissions that he received was to paint in uh, downtown Los Angeles on Olvera Street. This, um, the assignment was, and I quote, um, a continent full of happy men um, and palm trees. And Adam, guess what he painted? He didn't I can't he, guess. <laughs> he did not paint that. He, in the middle of the night, with his block of mural painters, the way he called them, he painted this really brutal um, image, uh, which was an indictment of I American imperialism. There's an American eagle on perched on top of this uh, figured figure, and uh, yeah. So this is this is the the, the cicadas, the strident political cicadas that uh, you're gonna get to see in Vida Americana. So, um, Barbara, maybe say a little bit of a word about um, there are a number of works by um, Japanese artists in, in this, and also the Mexican murals had a tremendous amount of influence on African American artists and painters like Charles White. There's a major mural, which I think yeah. one of the great treasures of the show. Yes, absolutely. So, one of the things that so kind of mesmerized American artists was this idea that art could really express issues of injustice and oppression. And the trajectory that the Mexicans expressed in their own murals from oppression to resistance to liberation was very much taken up and inspired artists, African American artists like Charles. Charles White, whose mural, mural you'll see in the upstairs, Hale Woodruff, again, uh, his mural is upstairs in the, ex in the exhibition, Aaron Douglas, um, that it, they were the ro a real role model. And most, many African American artists went to Mexico to work with the muralists and then worked with them when they came here. Um, and I have to go back, I love Sequeira, so. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, Jackson Pollock and his relationship to Sikiros and the various experiments he did on Union Square? And um, actually, like Colleen Smith, he did his own parade as well, Sikiros, which I think Pollock contributed to being in the parade. That's right. So Pollock is an interesting um, example of an American artist being influenced by the Mexican muralist because, as Marcella said in the, t in the video, um, he looked at P Prometheus. He visited the, the mural at Pomona College in 1930 and he proclaimed it the best painting in the Western Hemisphere. He kept an image of it in his studio throughout the 1930s. And upstairs you'll see him channeling Orozco's sort of visceral brushstroke and, and portrayal of stri struggle and trauma. But at the same time, then in 1936, he was in New York. Siqueiros had come back to, to the city in order to participate in the American Artists Congress. And he started what he called the experimental workshop. Sikiris was somebody who believed rep revolutionary art had to be revolutionary in technique as well as in subject matter. So he was very experimental using airbrush and splattering of paint and projections, all kinds of new techniques. And one of the things they did in the workshop was to lay canvas on the floor, for example, and throw paint on it, splatter it, pour paint on it. The idea of liberating artists from the confines of old-fashioned te techniques. Pollock was a member of the workshop. He was, in fact, one of the three artists that Siqueiros wrote to when he left to join the Spanish Republican Army in the, in the Spanish Civil War. So that Pollock was very much a part of the, of the workshop, and I think in a, in a certain way he wasn't, um, the, Harold Bloom has a phrase called the anxiety of influence, and I think in some ways Pollock never mentioned Siqueiros as being a major influence. Other people around him did, and said that this, ex, this, this experience of working with an artist that was so liberated in terms of technique was something that really led to Pollock's drip paintings in 1947. I mean, Pollock definitely had problems with uh, anxiety of influence. He never liked to credit anybody. Um, mm -hmm. And actually, when you go and you see the painting there, you see how much he learned from those artists. So this show really aims to change the understanding of art history. 
that all in America we've been taught that it was the French that dominated 20th century American art. And what this show proves is that the major influence between 1925 and 45 came from the Mexican muralists, that they influenced the style, the ideology, the subject matter of artists across the country, both well-known and, and less, less well-known. Um, how many artists are here representing and who from the Mexican side and how many artists do you document uh, were influenced the United States? So the, there are 200 works in the show and in a sense it's evenly divided between the Mexican and the American artists. The Mexican artists in a way have more presence in the show. We've reproduced three of their murals so in terms of the amount of space that they take up in the exhibition, they dominate. But the American artists hold their own. I mean, we're standing in front of a Pollock, for example. Pollock was influenced by Orozco, but then in 1936, when Siqueiros came back to the United States to participate in the American Artist Congress, he set up something called the Experimental Workshop. And he, they did political floats for political rallies and such. Pollock was part of that workshop, so he contributed to the floats. He was involved in the political activities of the workshop. But Siqueiros also had the idea, very important, that art not only was political, but in order to really be revolutionary, it had to be revolutionary in terms of technique also. So he experimented with lots of different techniques, airbrushing, cement, making work outdoors. But in the workshop, one of the things he did was he would put canvas down on the floor and the members of the workshop would pour paint on it and splatter and walk around it and put things in it, whether you know, wood, cigarettes, etc. And the idea that each age has its own technique, each age needs to find its own style, was something that Pollock uttered again and again as a paraphrase of, of Siqueiros. Pollock was one of the members of the workshop so close to the workshop that, that Siqueiros wrote to him and only two other people when he left to participate in the, in the Spanish Civil War. So, so Pollock, in retrospect, as he began to do his drip paintings and was lauded for being so original for doing this, introducing this new kind of technique, at that point he was really loath to look back and acknowledge his experience with Siqueiros although other people that were around him, his brother and his friends, did that for him. And there are many testimonials to how Pollock's experience with the liberation that Siqueiros brought to the workshop, the idea that one didn't need to adhere to conventional paint techniques, was really opened up for Pollock a whole new way of thinking about art. Um, did Orozco also influence Pollock? No. Orozco was the first influence on Pollock. Oh. So Pollock, as a 17-year-old, went to Pomona, where Orozco had done this amazing mural in the dining room of Prometheus. He said it was the best painting in the Western Hemisphere, and he kept a photograph of it in his studio throughout the 30s. And you can see in the exhibition work, Pollock work right next to an Orozco painting, that Pollock is really channeling the figurative vocabulary, the, the uh, bloody, color palette that, that Orozco used, the kind of architectonic monumental forms to portray strife and upheaval um, in, in the world, that Pollock's work very much channeled Orozco's. And he created something unique, but it definitely was on the back of, of Orozco, looking at, at Orozco and being, being influenced by this major American And Diego painter. Rivera, and um, I think the, the most uh, well-known name of an artist that he influenced was Ben Chon, maybe? Ben Chon. So, um, again, the connection between Orozco, Pollock, and Ben Chon. So Pollock, when he came to New York, after having seen the Prometheus mural, he came to New York and began working with Ben Chon. He was part of Ben Chon's family. He would have dinner with them, and Orozco would often come to dinner. Ben Chon was a great admirer of Orozco. He had been instrumental in organizing a big Orozco show, Orozco's first show in the United States at the Art Students League. Um, Orozco joined a, a gallery called the Delphic Studios and Ben Chon joined that gallery because of Orozco. They both made murals at the New School at exactly the same time. Benton was posing for Ben Chon's, um, tell us on Benton's figures, the same time that Orozco was painting his mural. So Benton would have come in, oops, can I say that again? Pollock would have come in contact with, with Orozco through Benton. 
And Benda was such an admirer of the Mexicans. He believed in Orozco, but he believed in all of them. He felt that they had set a model for art that wasn't just elitist, that really was in, in act, it encountered, interacted with the public, and that that was something he wanted American artists to do. Now, Ben Sean also uh, worked with Rivera, uh, both on the Rockefeller Center mural and uh, in the New Workers School. Yes. The story is that uh, Rivera actually went to hire Ben Sean rather than Ben Sean looking to be hired by Rivera. Is there any truth That's to that? That's right. So Rivera had seen Ben Sean's uh, Sacco and Vanzetti series at the Downtown Gallery, thought it was terrific. He wrote about it in print and he sought out Ben Sean to help him work on the Rockefeller Center project. And the two of them were very close. Ben Sean was, was in some senses the leader of the assistance that, that Rivera brought brought together to work on the project because they both spoke French and Rivera although he spoke English it wasn't um, he wasn't comfortable with English so Ben Sean was really the liaison between Rivera and his other assistants and in fact Ben Sean was really one of the people when Rockefeller demanded that Rivera substitute another face for Lenin's face Ben Sean threatened to organize his assistants to strike if Rivera changed the portrait Right, and after the Rockefeller mural project was ended, um, according to one Ben Chan biography, I don't know if you've heard this, um, when Frida and Diego left the Barbizon Hotel, they went and stayed with the Shans for a few weeks. Was yes, they were very close to the Shans. Rivera and Sean were, were, I would say, compatriots. And you can see in Sean's work, the total influence of Rivera, not only in terms of subject matter, but in the montage, quality, that kind of cinematic quality that both of them bring to their work. Cualquier ciudad es caben en una ciudad. Cuántas fronteras te atraviesan, tienes tú que atravesar. Invisibles como el aire, de cemento o hechas de lenguaje. Cuántas ciudades caben en una ciudad. Cuántas fronteras te atraviesan, tienes tú que atravesar. Invisibles como el aire, de cemento o hechas de lenguaje. Aquí estamos, aguantando. Existimos porque respiramos mm, De carne y hueso aunque quieran borrarlo Más abajo del subsuelo donde no vive ni el miedo ¿Me ves? Mm, yo aquí te veo Soy la sobra en el plato, la curva, el garabato Que emborrona todas las hojas de cálculo uh -huh. Debajo de la piel llevo el microchip Desde la cuna, programado para mal vivir ¿Qué quieres? ¿Tú dónde estás? Yo estoy aquí, a los dos lados de la frontera La que te atraviesa entera y se carga las espaldas ¿Crees que las saltas?